Thanks to KiwiCo for supporting this episode of Journey to the Microcosmos. Click the link in the description to learn more and for a special offer. The paramecium is the consummate model organism. It's a protozoan that is both easy to grow and easy to study, which means that microbiologists have been able to learn all sorts of secrets about eukaryotic life by watching them. You might even call the paramecium a hero in our pursuit of knowledge. But just as heroes in stories have enemies, the paramecium has its own foe. And it is this strange critter. No, not the big eggplant-shaped looking thing, the smaller one. The one that looks a bit like a swimming okra. This is didinium, though it wasn't always called that. When Otto Friedrich Muller first described it in 1786, he thought he was observing a vorticella, and so he named it Vorticella nasciuta. Almost a century later, Samuel Friedrich Stein would change its name to didinium. Like its paramecium foil, the didinium is a ciliate, but at first glance, it doesn't seem like it should be much of a problem. For one thing, paramecium can just get so much larger than a didinium. Plus, the didinium is just weird looking. In fact, between the paramecium and the didinium, the didinium is the one that actually looks like food. We compared it to an okra earlier, but at other times, it looks more like a stretched out acorn. And the pointier bit looks like a jalapeno stem. Of course, it is not a stem, it is the didinium's proboscis, which means that is the front of the organism. And there's still plenty of weird to go. The didinium has a long macronucleus that curves into a sort of figure eight shape. And circling the organism's body are two rows of cilia called pectinelles that seem almost randomly placed. One row sits at the border of the proboscis and the rest of the body, while the other clinches the middle like a loose belt. It's a little bit tough to see the pectinelles in their full fringy glory with our microscope. They look more like four bundles of hair on the sides of the didinium, but you can see what it looks like better in this illustration. And those cilia give didinium both its very fast and very strange movement. When the didinium moves, it really moves, but not necessarily in a way that seems obvious to us at first glance. Just trying to follow it with a camera feels a little stressful. The first time James found one, it slipped so quickly in and out of view that he barely caught a glimpse. He had to switch to a lower magnification so he could zoom out and see it. But for the didinium, this seemingly out of control movement is very deliberate. It's constantly rotating in a clockwise fashion, but also leaning towards one side so that it's moving in a spiral path. In the early 20th century, scientists added ink to jelly just so they could slow the didinium down and follow this path. The microbe's seemingly aimless trajectory helps the didinium cover a wide range of space in a short amount of time. Think of it compared to another skilled hunter we watched recently, the Lacrimaria olor, which sends its neck out into all directions to maximize the odds of encountering something. The didinium is doing something similar, but instead of extending its neck, it's sending its whole body into different directions. And that speed is a big reason why didinium is so effective. As it zips around the microcosmos, it will bump into things that don't happen to be food, and when it does, it politely backs up and moves on. But if its proboscis makes contact with something edible, then the didinium goes to work, seizing its prey with its proboscis, paralyzing it, and then eating it. And while it's known to consume other organisms, what didinium really, really likes to eat are paramecium. It doesn't matter that a paramecium might be six times its size. The didinium is here for a meal, and it will gladly expand itself around the paramecium to swallow it. But as you can see, this is not a smooth process. The didinium is still moving and bumping around as it consumes the paramecium, and for a while, 
It's hard to even tell where the predator ends and the prey begins. The only real didinium-like thing about it is the spiral path it still takes as it eats and eats and eats, but eventually it settles back into its more awkward-looking self. So incredible is the didinium's appetite that scientists have observed it eating a pair of dividing paramecium. They've also occasionally been observed exploding from eating too much. So there are hazards to this lifestyle. But while the didinium is extremely talented at hunting paramecium, and also capable of hunting other organisms, it's actually pretty bad in some of its other conquests. When didinium tried to eat rotifers, they are stymied by the relatively tough exterior, and other ciliates like stentors are too large and too tough and too active for the didinium to do much damage to. And paired with its favorite prey, the didinium is its own model system. In the early 20th century, mathematicians came up with equations to describe how populations of predators and prey oscillate in response to each other. More predators means less prey, which then means fewer predators and more prey lather, rinse, and repeat. And you get a cycle that shapes relationships between species in many different environments. And in attempting to see if they could recreate these equations that were for the macroscopic world in a microscopic environment, scientists and labs turned to paramecium and didinium to act as a model predator-prey system. It turned out to be not so straightforward to mimic nature in the lab. When scientists first started watching didinium and paramecium in a flask, the didinium would inevitably consume the paramecium to extinction, in turn driving their own deaths. It was only by building on these experiments and finding ways to adjust the interactions between predator and prey that they could reconstruct the oscillations we expect in nature. Of course, that doesn't mean they directly copied what nature does. How could they, with an experimental design meant to strip many of the confounding elements of ecology from their observations? But their work still provided insights into how organisms interact. It's like a story, incapable of holding the vast entirety of existence, and yet still very useful in its narrowness. That the consummate model organism has such a consummate model predator, then, is quite fortunate for us. Even if, for the microcosmos, it's just another story. Thank you for coming on this journey with us as we explore the unseen world that surrounds us. And thank you again to KiwiCo for supporting this episode. KiwiCo creates super cool hands-on projects for kids that make learning fun. With a KiwiCo subscription each month, the kid in your life will receive a fun, engaging new project which will help develop their creativity and confidence. They have eight subscription lines, each catering to different age groups and topics, and each box is designed by experts and tested with kids. In their Eureka Crate, intended for ages 14 and up, you can get this two-in-one lantern kit that lets you construct a camping lantern that also transforms into a flashlight. So, if you want to give a gift that keeps the fun and learning going all year long, a KiwiCo subscription delivers Steam Discovery long after the holiday decorations are put away. So head on over to kiwico.com slash journey50 and use the code journey50 or click the link in the description for 50% off your first month of any crate. And thank you as always to our patrons, all of you people on the screen right now. You're the people that keep this show happening. If you want to become one of those people and support this show, you can go to patreon.com slash journey to micro. If you want to see more from our master of microscopes, James, check out jam and germs on Instagram. And if you want to see more from us, there's always a subscribe button somewhere nearby.